Good morning and welcome. It's a pleasure to see some familiar faces and to be with you all again from downtown Boston, atop of Beacon Hill. For those who don't know the church, the church is, um, that I serve is located on the top of Beacon Hill, and we are the highest sitting church in the city. As a primer to today's service, I want us to think about what is darkness. And in our call to worship, we're going to hear some things about light and darkness. And I would like us to try and shift our understanding from what we see to the things that we love. And we think about light in terms of love, which is weird as Swedenborgians, I know because normally we think about light in terms of understanding. But what I want to try and shift is to have this understanding, I guess, that, that we can't really separate truth and love. And so what we love is as much a part of light as what we understand. And so with that, arise Jerusalem, let your light shine for all to see. For the glory of the Lord rises to shine on you. Darkness, as black as night, covered all the nations of the earth. But the glory of the Lord rises and appears over you. All nations will come to your light. Mighty kings will come to see your radiance. Most loving and gracious God, we gather in this virtual community. One might say a close representation to the spiritual world in that the affections of our lives draw us together into this virtual space. Hear us now, O Lord, as we lift up our thoughts and our prayers toward you. Most gracious and loving God, we give you, we give you thanks for the manifold gifts of grace and love that we experience in our world. For the first responders, for all who work in hospitals, for all who stand up and work toward justice the open hearts that reach out towards those in our communities that are in the most need. Lord, we ask you to continue to lead us and guide us that our hopes, our dreams are found in love instead of worldly things. Help us move toward a world or care for the neighbor as a greater commodity than anything else. We ask for your peace in our heart, in our community, and throughout the world. We ask all of these things, praying the prayer that you have taught, as we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Creator, sustainer, and redeemer. We gather in this community looking at images of light, colors, remembering the lighting of candles, all things which help point our minds toward you. 
as we look towards your light, O Lord. Turn our hearts. Help us focus our being on living for you and the love that you created us to be. Help us remember the providence that brought us to this location. Through the good thoughts and the difficulties, the journeys of our life, in all their ups and all their downs. As you brought the people from Canaan into Egypt and from Egypt back to Canaan. Help us in our wanderings, O oh Lord. That the things that distract us, the things that sometimes lead us astray might be quieted. That we might realize that doing your divine will is truly what our happiness and our freedoms are based in. Help us be more perfectly your children. In your most loving name we pray. May the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Light at night. I have a candle. There, wait, well, there it is. Oftentimes in our churches, we look towards the concept of light as being love and wisdom. And, and what we should remember is even though that's not a real candle, well, it's an image of a real candle. Even the candles we look at, the light and the heat of, of actual things is still a, a correspondence. It, it has a certain deeper meaning and sense, but it's not tied specifically to that item. A candle can fall over and burn a house down and a candle can light the night. But what I would argue is that most of what we see, most of, most of what we experience is an external reality. And it is merely a container for what's on the inside. In our modern age, more and more, uh, we're kind of hearing the question, what's the point of church? Sometimes even what's the purpose of prayer? Just yesterday, I was at an event. And, I, you know, when people know you're a minister, they automatically start talking to you about things that are not always asked or bidden. And yet they know it. And so they raise up in the middle of unsus unsuspecting places issues about faith crises that they might be experiencing. And one of these comments that he made was basically a statement that he didn't re doesn't really agree that churches get to have a corner on teaching truth. He's concerned at how the Christian church in our multicultural world can somehow claim to be better than a Muslim or a Jew, a Sikh, a Hindu, a Buddhist, the list goes on. Realizing that that particular time was not the right time, I handed him a business card in hopes that we could connect. Because again, it's so easy for us to look at the things that we see and assume that it's true. When what's actually true is actually contained within what we see and what we experience. I used one of my favorite examples with him very quickly before I ended the conversation. That's uh, one of a cup. 
At church, and this is a very messy thing, and I won't do it around a computer. At church, one of my favorites example is to take a cup of water and just pour that cup out onto a table. So the water goes everywhere. I might start out first by asking somebody if they're thirsty and they'd like some water and then dump it on the table. But the point being is when the water hits the table and it goes everywhere, the water basically becomes next to useless outside of maybe humidifying the air. In order for the water to actually have any kind of purpose that actually helps us, we need to have a container, a glass. We need a structure. Faith is this structure. Now, I use water in this situation, which we normally understand to be truth in its correspondence in scripture. But in this situation, I'm really talking about it more as an understanding of love. It's the thing inside the container. I guess I could use wine, which has a correspondence of, well, liquids in general have a correspondence of truth, but it's a united truth and love, even when you use wine. But it's this concept that inside everything, there is what gives it life and meaning and substance not shape. The shape is the truth. The shape is the structure. Swedenborg, of course, uses a concept of distinguishly one. We cannot have something that's good really be separate from both its love or its wisdom. In the world of charity and faith, like our reading from Swedenborg today, you cannot have faith separated from charity. So much to the point that if you remove charity from faith, the faith ceases to be faith. And likewise, charity without any kind of faith ceases to be faith. Absolute destruction. We as people who go to church, we as people who might pray, In this weird world of online church, in this world where more and more people are ceasing to go to church, that question of what is the value of church will continue to come up. What I hope to be able to tell the person I was talking to yesterday is that you need a container. You need a container that is focused towards where you want to go in order to grow. You need some group of people, some association of like-minded people to help you advance toward what it is God is calling you to be. If we live our lives in sort of the Amazon or internet marketplace, we can be hit with all different sorts of, of pithy quotes of superficial truths that really distract us and lead us astray. The value of the container is essential, but only insofar as it's containing something that's meaningful. So all the time we hear this concept about you can't put new wine into old wineskins. And so often when we hear this quote, the statement is being made, um, the things of the old church are dead and you can't put what's really important into them. We use it all the time to talk about how uh, old music shouldn't be used anymore because new music is worth it. In fact, what we oftentimes do is we use this Bible quote to really just justify what it is that we want to hear, what we want to see, what we want to do. We very rarely finish the actual quote. 
No one puts new wine into old wineskins, otherwise the new wine will burst and the skins will be spilled. You can't make something new be contained in what's old or it will be destroyed. You must put it into a new fresh wine skin. But here's the kicker that no one ever gets to this part of the reading. But the new wine must be put into fresh wine skins and no one after drinking old wine desires the new wine. You never hear that. You always hear people say, oh, you can't put what's new into what's old, but they never go to the next sentence and saying, but nobody wants what's new. Within Jewish tradition, within Jewish writing, within Jewish prayer, you have a really interesting thing that is part of, of their culture, which we don't always pay attention to. We, we might be aware of it when that it happens, but they have this great thing where they look to the past. In every Seder, in every Jewish tradition, they remember the works of God liberating them from slavery, of helping them claim the Holy Land, of giving them access to being the, chose, the chosen people. Very rarely in the Christian church do we do that. We generally tend to kind of instantly pray to where we want to go, and we don't spend the time to ask this question, where have we been? One would argue that in our reading from Joshua today, Joshua is the man who conquers the Holy Land. And he opens his address to the people, not about look at where we're going to live, but look at what's happened to us. Look at where we came from. Look at everything we've gone through. And I also want to just quickly do this little correction here. We use the language that the people of Israel wandered for 40 years. They didn't really wander for 40 years. It took them 40 years to get there, but they really didn't go in a crazy, circly route. Within the first year, they get to Mount Sinai, they camp. They spend a long time there. They send spies into the Holy Land. They come out, and then they go around. But the entire time, they're camping and stopping. They're not actually constantly walking, right? So I'm going to use the term as they were spiritually wandering because they were scared to live up to the promise that God gave them. They were scared to enter the Holy Land because they were scared of the giants they saw. They were scared to enter the Holy Land because they didn't trust God to enter the Holy Land. Joshua represents that part of us that recognizes God and wants to reform and transform our lives through scripture. But in this passage, a remembrance of where you've been what has gotten, to you, gotten you to this place is essential before asking the question, where are we going to go? Sometimes my criticism of, of the church is that we fail to ask the question of what's gotten here. We oftentimes say, oh, things of the old way are bad and we must do new things. And while that might be true, while new forms of worship are essential, we have to start with understanding the journey, understanding the steps. When we go into prayer, if we close our eyes and simply start saying, dear God, I want my new bike, we will probably be let down. But if we go into prayer, with an understanding of thankfulness of our lives, thankfulness of our journeys, looking at the trials and the tribulations that we've been delivered from in the past in order to get where we are, what might that do for our hearing of what God is telling us now? How might we understand that, well, maybe we're praying about something which seems absolute and final, life ending, how many times have we had that feeling in the past? How many times 
have we failed to understand what the journey is? The Lord brought the people out of Egypt and in every worship service, in every festival, even in most of the Psalms, you will hear that memory of the old essential truth. God has been there for us. And we need to struggle with what we are supposed to do. Our history, our past, the journey that brought us here gives shape and form to what the Lord has done. The love of God has filled us and it has taken that form. But so often we look just at our present moment and into the future and we see a shape that we want. We see a glass or a form that we enjoy and we don't ask the question of whether or not we're actually liking the new wine, liking the message or the truth of God that, that is the reality behind everything. Usually we're looking at our own desire. The bridesmaids are exactly this. And I, sometimes I feel like the bridesmaids get a little bit of a bad rap because we need to remember the bridesmaids who had lamps but didn't bring the extra flax still had some oil. They didn't come with nothing, but they fell asleep. And they fell asleep. Oddly enough, they were burning oil while they slept. They had light, even though they couldn't see it. They had light, even though they were asleep. I think in our lives, when we think about darkness, we oftentimes think about darkness in terms of the spiritual state. We think about darkness in terms of being sad. We think about darkness in terms of, of those difficult times. And, and that's certainly true if you look at the day as a symbol of our transformation. But I would like to posit the idea that what if sometimes the darkest times of our lives might be times where we feel perfectly happy or times when we're very excited what if the dark times in our lives are judged by the closeness of God with us? And I'm going to pick on what I, my favorite example is winning the lottery. Everybody, the second they win the lottery, certainly always says, thank God for winning the lottery. It's a blessing. God has given me this gift. More often than not, I'm going to guess that they are not thinking really about anything other than their worldly wants and desires. They're thinking about how the material benefits going to help them. They're not thinking about the fact that the winning of the lottery is actually pulling them away from focusing on God. When we get the things of this world we want, we actually shut the door on God a little bit. It's kind of crazy. When you get what you want, you actually distance yourself from the divine. See, when we get what you want, we stop asking the question of what is God calling me to do? What if the darkness isn't what we think? Swedenborg tells us that all good things that happen to us, we are supposed to give credit to God. This is a reminder that even in those good times, we need to be seeking a connection. The bridesmaids aren't just women with lamps. They're people waiting to get married. Swedenborg says whenever marriage is written in the Bible, that it symbolizes the union of love and truth the union of charity and faith, 
the union between people and God. All of these things are true. The oil, the oil is that part of the lamp that we don't see. The thing that our faith, our lives really burns on. Charity towards God and the neighbor. When I hear the the statement, new wines and old wineskins being used about, oh, we shouldn't worship a traditional way, or we shouldn't worship in a new way, I keep getting upset because people are missing the point. The point of worship cannot be what it is we want to have happen to us. The point of worship is looking for God's presence in our hearts and in our lives. The point of prayer can't be about us asking to get something. It must be about us looking for God to tell us what to do. The basics of worship, the basics of prayer is humility, and that humility is only found in loving others and loving God. Otherwise, what you've done is fall asleep. You might be praying to God about something that's happy. You might be praying to God about something that's sad. You might be worshiping something that's joyous. You might be holding some form of a meditative service about something that's sad. As long as your desire is driving the worship, it ceases to be worship. This is what it means to trim our lamp. Adjust our flame to recognize where the love and goodness really comes from. For those people who let their oil burn out, these are the burn out, these are the people who who aren't paying attention to the real presence of God in worship. They're only paying attention to what they want to their own dream, to their own sleep. They've shut themselves off from God because they're saying, I want my way. I am going to pray in such a way that asks God to do my will. I'm going to make myself the center of creation. I am going to make myself the purpose of all existence. So often we define darkness as unhappiness, but maybe, maybe the darkness, when we're willing to take a step back and examine what is it that God would have us do, is a brighter time. Maybe the conflict on the cross is the blessing from God that helps us transform. Maybe it's those moments of pain and difficulty that can remind us what it means to have charity, what it means to look to God, what it means to have humility. In our worship and in our prayer, what would it mean for us to look at our journey, to look at the good times and the bad times, to help us remember in the good that bad may come and in the bad that good will eventually come, that God is there and leading us in some journey of humility that goes up and down. I would argue that when we pray in such a way that remembers the old and looks to the new, that understands the ups and the downs of the journey, that we call ourselves into a better understanding, a better relationship of faith with God, one that does not lie in our own image, but one that takes into account what God has done for us. These are the flasks of oil, that little bit of charity, which we find in what we're willing to bring with us in order to help us see, instead of just bringing what's with us now in hopes that we might get what we want. In the week ahead, I hope when you stop in prayer, when you stop for a moment of worship, you will bring the journey with you. The things that help give you the faith you have now, the ups, the downs, the history of your life 
with God being present and God delivering you, that wherever you are, whether you are in the heights or in the depths, you can bring a fuller sense of yourself to what you are doing. Amen.